proteins and nucleic acids, so DNA and RNA, and other sorts of biological molecules are really, really awesome, but they're shy. They're not really going to talk to us, and so if we want to find out information about them, we have to use different experimental techniques. Depending on the types of questions that we want answered, um, we'll use different techniques. I have a lot of information on my blog about these various techniques, and I have, now that my blog is live, I was able to update my lab techniques page where I have um, information about a bunch of different techniques. So I'm going to walk you through this page, kind of give you an overview of the various techniques that you might encounter. Again, the things that you'll encounter are going to depend on the questions that you're trying to answer. But here are some of the fundamental techniques as well as some more obscure ones, but things that I've just happened to do in the past um, to give you an idea of the types of things that you might encounter and maybe an idea of the types of experiments that you could use to answer certain questions. So I hope it helps. And then you can, there are links on all of the those different um, on the page to post on all of those different topics um, with lots of information and figures and things like that um, and so hope this helps there's a lot on the page but don't worry like about most of it and it's just I just want to take you through it so that you know what's here and that you know some of the various things um, that you might encounter in a lab the key key things that you'll probably encounter are going to be gel electrophoresis, which we can use to separate protein or DNA by size. So you have like SDS page and agarose gel electrophoresis, we'll get into those, um, as well as methods to visualize them. Um, you'll also often be doing some sort of PCR to make copies of a specific sequence of DNA, uh, maybe to see if it's there or because you want to work with that sequence. Um, there are also another really common thing is molecular cloning. So basically you take a sequence, maybe the C DNA, the complementary DNA of a messenger RNA. So basically the instructions for making a protein. And you can stick that into a circular piece of DNA called a plasmid, then stick that into bacteria and get the bacteria to make a protein for you. Um, this is a really, really common thing that you'll probably be doing. If you want to study a specific protein, you can even make changes to that um, to the sequence to make changes to the protein and then see what effect that had. Um, so molecular cloning is really, really common. I'll talk about some of the methods to actually get this, the plasmid into cells, make sure that everything worked, get the plasmid out of cells with this thing called a mini prep, um, various things like that. Then there's also various methods to, um, to measure interactions between proteins, between proteins and RNA and proteins and DNA. Some things about cell culture, um, some various things about making solutions and experiments, setting up your experiments. Um, structural biology, because I came from a structural biology lab, so extracristallography, cryo-EM, things like this. Um, and then I did a ton, a ton of protein expression and purification. So I have a whole page on that that I'll take you really, really quickly through at the end. Um, but really, I just want you to be familiar with the idea that these things exist and give you a sense of the types of experiments that you might be doing or that you might think about doing. Gel electrophoresis is a method that you would use to separate molecules based on their size by using electricity to send them traveling through a gel mesh. The bigger things are going to get tangled up more, so they're going to go slower. Um, and then when you visualize them, they'll show up as bands on the gel and the bigger things will be higher up. If we're talking about doing pro separating proteins, we typically use SDS page. And for nucleic acids, um, so for DNA, we're typically using like agarose gels. Um, and then for small bits of DNA or RNA, um, we often use urea page. Um, these, so like SDS page and urea page, these are examples of denaturing gels. Um, if we want to like leave the structure so proteins have structure and RNAs have structure, um, so DNAs, but RNA especially because it's single-stranded and it folds up and stuff. This can influence how the um, how they run through the gel. So we typically get denature or unfold them first. Um, this is also go, going to interrupt the interactions that those proteins might be having with one another or protein in, um, RNA or protein DNA interactions, all these interactions, you won't be able to see them. So there's a method called native page. In native page, it's non-denaturing. Um, and you leave the things, you leave the complexes together. So this is a way that you can then tell if they're interacting because they're going to travel as if they were bigger because they're stuck together. But this isn't going to happen if you run one of these denaturing gels. Often, typically, you're running one of these denaturing gels, um, but native page is an option um, and you sometimes see it used.
In terms of actually making the gels, a lot of times um, these gels um, for the page gels, so for the polyacrylamide gels, so polyacrylamide versus the agarose. So agarose is going to have like bigger and less evenly distributed um, pores in the mesh. Um, so it's good for bigger things and when you don't need as fine of a separation. Polyacrylamide gels, these are going to have finer pore sizes that are for good separation of smaller things. Um, both of these you can make yourself, and for the page gels, you can also buy them pre-made. For the page gels, they're going to be thin, and you run them vertically. For the agarose gels, these are thicker, they're like slabs, kind of like a brick, um, and you run them horizontally. Um, both of these cases, you're using like the same gel box to send the things traveling through. Um, but those are the two main things that you'll probably do are going to be page gels and agarose gels to separate. Um, typically, you're using SDS page for proteins, um, unless you're working in like an RNA or a DNA focused lab, where you might be running um, page gels for DNA and RNA as well. Um, but you're often using these agarose gels. This is one of the most common things probably in any sort of molecular biology or biochemistry lab. When you run those gels, typically you're doing it because you want to look and see what's there. Uh, maybe you want to see how pure it is. The number of bands is gonna tell you about purity. The more bands there are, the more stuff that's in there. Um, and also you can see, basically, you'll see the relative sizes of things based on the ladder, which is this molecular weight standard that you run alongside it. Um, so that can tell you the information about those things, but you need to be able to see it. So you need to be able to visualize the protein. You need to be able to visualize the DNA. You need to be able to visualize the RNA. And so we have various gain methods that we can do in order to visualize the bands in the gel. And then we also have methods that we can use to um, like, see if certain things are there, to look and probe for specific things rather than staining for all of the things. Additionally, we have methods that we can use if we want to actually use this gel as a form of purification to cut out those bands um, and use them. So how do we see those bands? Um, so for protein, we're often using Comassi Brilliant Blue. Um, so the CBB, the stain, um, it often comes in, you might have like an instant blue or a quick blue or something like that. Nowadays, it's often like these instant stains, which are like these colloidal forms, that, or the, you might have the classic form, which is like a darker blue, and then you have to de-stain that classic one. Um, but basically, you just pour the stain on your gel, it'll stain all the proteins. You may or may not need to do a de-stain step to get rid of all the background on the gel. And then we're every place there's proteins, you should see um, this blue band. Um, the bigger bands, the bands higher up are going to represent bigger proteins. The ones smaller, lower down are going to be smaller proteins. And the relative intensity is going to tell you about the relative quantity of proteins in the gel. For nucleic acids, um, we can use new we typically use fluorescent stains. Um, so the Comassi is visual. They're also fluorescent protein stains, but typically this Comassi is basically visual. It's blue. You see it. Um, with your eyes. With the fluorescence, you have to actually stick it on like a machine um, to actually get or some or a UV tray or something. Basically, you need to excite the fluorophore in order to see it. So a fluorophore is something that absorbs light of one wavelength and gives it back at another wavelength. So you can shine light on this, um, you shine light on this stained DNA or RNA, um, then it'll give you back light that then the machine can, um, can read or that you can then see on the tray. Um, common ones that are used are like aphidium bromide as well as DAPI. Um, so these fluorescent stains are generic um, in terms of they'll bind like any sort of nucleic acid and then they'll allow you to see it. Um, another form of staining, these are the, like the most commonly used stains that you'll probably use. Um, there's also something called a Ponceau stain that we often use for mem staining membranes reversibly. And I'll tell you uh, when we're doing like a, a Western blot or something like that, I'll tell you about. Um, another method for staining protein gels is silver staining. This is a lot more sensitive. It's also a lot more finicky and involved. Um, but if you need to detect really tiny levels of protein, silver stain might be a way to go. Okay, so those are going to tell you about everything that's there. If you want to look for specific things being there, this isn't going to tell you anything about the identity of what's there. If you want to say, okay, is there a spe is this specific protein I'm interested in present in this sample? If so, is it present at larger amounts? Is my like 
is there more of it than in this other condition? Maybe once you compare the, the expression of a certain protein between different conditions. How we commonly do this is this technique called a Western blot. Basically, you separate the proteins just like you would in a normal SDS page. You run a normal SDS page, but then what you're going to do is you're actually going to use antibodies to um, specific to the protein that you want to see um, and then test and see, okay, is that protein actually there um, by visualizing the antibodies. Um, and you can't just do it directly in the gel, so you have to blot it onto a membrane. And so that's where the blot step comes in. You're taking it out of the gel onto this membrane, and then there you, know, you go through the workflow in order to probe and see if that specific thing was there. So much more in Western blots um, in the post. There's also other kinds of blots. So that was telling you about proteins. There's also blots that tell you about DNA and RNA after you run one of those agarose gels or one of those other page gels. Um, you can do a northern blot if you want to look for RNA using DNA. This is going to take advantage of the complementarity between the different, between ATCG and AU. I always forget AU with RNA and DNA. Um, but anyway, those are the complementarity. And so you can use that complementarity in order to probe for specific sequence. Um, so if you look for, want to look for RNA using DNA, you can do a northern blot. Um, if you want to look for DNA using DNA, you can use a southern blot. Um, you can also use like RNA to look for RNA, but RNA is more sensitive and expensive. And so you typically use DNA probes. Okay, um, so those are different kinds of blots. And typically these are going to be fluorescently labeled or radioactively labeled that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, those, so these are all ways that you can see whether, so here you're seeing, okay, whether how much of every, like all the proteins, all the nucleic acids. Then you can look for specific proteins or specific nucleic acids. But what if you actually wanna do something with that? All of that was just like looking. What if you actually wanna take it out? So we commonly use, or I guess, depending on you, what your purpose, um, scientists often use gel extraction. So basically, because you're separating the different things that were in that mixture by their size, well, now you can actually take them out of the gel and purify them, and then you have pure, you have that pure um, per, um, RNA or DNA. You're not going to use this for protein extraction because probably because it's going to be such a tiny little amount. Um, if you want to do protein expression um, and purification, um, I actually have like a whole page on protein expression and purification because we I've done a lot, a lot of it. And we have a lot of different methods to purify proteins, um, typically with chromatography. So we have different comment columns or um, we'll fill the different resin that we can use to separate proteins based on their size. Um, and this is going to allow us to purify like large quantities of things. So even though there's like a smaller, like a, a ver there's a version called size exclusion chromatography, which separates things based on their size for proteins. But this is, we're talking here, we're typically talking about larger amounts and we're actually want to like work with the protein afterwards. If we're running a gel, we're, we're not talking about working with the protein afterwards, but we might want to work with the RNA or DNA. Um, and especially um, sometimes if you're doing it for purification, there's actually ones with like bigger wells and stuff that you can use. Um, but so you can basically get that band out of the gel using gel extraction. If you're doing this for like RNA or something like that, it might be, um, or DNA, something like that. It could be for various purposes. Maybe you are studying an RNA binding protein. And so you want to like, you transcribe this RNA in vitro and now you want to actually purify it and work with it. It might be because you're trying to prepare some sort of sequencing library. It might be because for DNA, for like an agarose gel or something, if you're doing molecular cloning, which we'll talk about, where basically you're combining different pieces of DNA, you need to sometimes purify those pieces of DNA, especially if you're doing like a, a restriction enzyme digest. And so you like cut the parts apart and now you need to like put the right parts together. Um, and so you need to extract those from the gel. Um, a, a way that you can use this is, there's, so there's, for the agarose gels, it's easier. Um, for the page gels, there's different methods. Um, one is like a gel, um, this crush and soak method where literally you crush up the band and then put it in a large amount of liquid. And so then it can diffuse out. Um, so more on that here. When you extract it, and also just if you purified from somewhere else, you often have to go through like a step to like concentrate it and remove anything that's like all salts and various things that you were that were in the mixture. Um, so there are very various methods to like precipitate out the DNA or RNA. Um, various columns that you can use to want to change the buffer or get rid of salts. 
on the like column based methods, which are also really helpful if you, after done doing like some sort of end labeling reaction. So remember with like these types of probes, we can use radio labeled or fluorescently labeled um, DNA or RNA in order to probe for specific um, DNA or RNA fragments. We then have to get rid of the free probe. Um, and so we can do this using these columns and we can also use these types of columns just when we're doing um, like desalting and stuff like that. Um, getting rid of things that we don't want in our reaction anymore. Um, so yeah, another way, so basically you can get them out of the gels. You can also, another thing you might be doing is doing like some sort of RNA extraction with this like phenyl chloroform method, like this trizol. Um, you might see some trizol in the lab. It's this pink looking thing and that's going to be allowing you to extract um, RNA and DNA and stuff. You can view it from tissues um, and from cells and all sorts of really um, of stuff like that. So this is um, another really commonly used thing. Um, and again, it's all going to depend on what types of things that your lab cares about, what you care about, the types of questions you want to answer. Um, so when you're doing another thing, so these columns are basically, these are kind of like filled with this little like gel and it's going to basically allow you to change out the buffer and get rid of any salts. There are also um, these, it's, and your thing goes through this, through the gel, your, um, you know, your RNA or, or your protein goes through this gel and it's going to come out of the gel with what was in the gel before. So this is why you're used, you can use it to change buffers. Um, just note, we often use this term buffer to refer to any sort of solution, um, but technically the buffer part is the pH buffer. So it keep, maintains a constant pH and then there's often a bunch of different salts and various things depending on the purpose. Um, but if you want to change the buffer it's in, these columns are going to allow you to do that. Um, you might see something like a G25, a G50 column. There's just this little columns filled with this little resin. Um, and then they have ones for proteins as well. Um, and sometimes these are bigger. You might see something like a PD10. Um, but basically, they allow you to change out the buffer, get rid of excess salts and things like that. There are also these columns, um, these types of columns where there's like a membrane and then the nucleic acid binds to this membrane and then everything else flows through. Um, so here, instead of the beads, there's this membrane and the DNA or RNA is actually sticking to this. This is going to allow you to concentrate things and then elute them so it'll get them off in a smaller volume. So here it's not, it's not like um, concentrating things, it's just removing the salts. Um, and changing the buffer. Here you're actually concentrating things and you can wash off things. Um, so these spin columns are going to, um, you probably encounter these a lot, both with PCR purification. Um, so like cleaning up PCR reactions, which I'll talk about, as well as the, after you're in a mini prep, which I'll talk about, um, but various, these columns. Um, so PCR, polymerase chain reaction. This is another one of those techniques that's super duper fundamental. Um, in biochemistry and molecular biology. It allows you to make lots and lots of copies. We call this amplify regions of a DNA sequence. Um, so you take these little DNA sequences called primers and you design them so that one goes on one side of what you want to amplify and the other goes on the other. So they're like bookending it. And then it'll make lots and lots of copies of it um, in these little tiny test tubes in this machine called a thermal cycler. So it's a really, really helpful technique that you can use to make copies of things. Um, and you'll likely be doing it with like cloning or, or qPCR to see where things are more in a second. Um, but there are various types of PCR and it's something that you'll probably be doing a lot. Um, here are there are various variations on PCR as well as various tips and stuff um, that you can find here. As I mentioned, this term called qPCR. So like there's quant that's like quantitative PCR. So there's a bunch of different abbreviations you might see. You might see like RT-PCR, which could stand for reverse transcription PCR or real-time PCR or both. Um, and then qPCR, which kind of stands for quantitative PCR, but often is used to talk about re real-time reverse transcription PCR. Basically, what, these, what you can do with these methods is you can measure the copies as they're being made. So if you want to why you might want to do this is because the more copies you start with each co each cycle of you go cycles so you like split them apart you um amplify them you put them back together you split them apart you amplify them and so each time you're like doubling um the amount that you that you that you had in the previous round 
Um, and so the more you start with, the quicker you're going to get to really, really, really high numbers. And if you were to able to measure those as they were getting made, you would get an idea about, okay, how long does it take to us get us to a really high number? Um, and the more cycles it takes to do that, the less of the starting thing there was, the more there was of the starting thing, the fewer cycles it's going to take. And so if you're able to measure that, then you would get an idea of how much was present in the beginning. So maybe you want to compare the levels of a specific DNA, maybe um, a specific DNA in different samples. And you can do this with this qPCR and with this like real time piece where it's real time because you're like watching it in real time each cycle, there's like a little fluorescent probe um, that'll then give you a readout of how many copies have been made. The uh, reverse transcription part comes in because a lot of the times, if you want to measure like the expression of something, you might want to look and see, okay, how many messenger RNA copies of that thing are present? Um, and so in order to make copies of those with PCR, you first need to take that messenger RNA and you need to reverse transcribe it. You need to turn it into DNA. DNA is what this PCR works with. Um, and so you need to make it a DNA version of the RNA, which we call cDNA, complementary DNA, and then you can measure the copies of that. Um, and so that you get RT-QPCR, which is a very commonly used technique. And it's actually used in diagnostics like the, um, like the COVID tests, um, the PCR tests. Okay, so that's one way to measure like gene expression. When we talk about gene expression, we can talk about various levels. Um, so we could talk about the gene being transcribed. So you make an messenger RNA copy of it. We can talk about the, it being trans, that messenger RNA being translated. So you make protein from the messenger RNA. And then that protein can get degraded. The messenger RNA can get degraded. You have all this regulation happening. Um, and we have various methods that we can use to measure things at those various levels. Um, so if we want to measure transcription, we can do things like Paul do chip seek to be, see what's being transcribed um, where, by looking where that RNA polymerase is bound. Um, we can measure the RNA levels, as we saw with RT-QPCR. There's also the northern blot we talked about. Um, it's like a microarray, which was more common um, in the past. And then there's like an RNA sequencing, which is really common these days, is you just sequence all the RNA that's there. Um, you can also measure translation from things like polysome profiling and riboseq. So polysome profiling is going to look and see how many ribosomes, so the protein making machinery, how many of them are on the various transcripts and like riboseq or ribosome footprinting. Um, you're basically looking to see where on those transcripts, where on those messenger RNAs the ribosomes are bound. Um, and then you can measure the actual protein itself using mass spectrometry, which is basically going to chop up all those proteins, measure their size, um, they, well, their mass to charge ratio, and then compare all those little chopped up pieces there, um, identify them in a database and figure out what proteins were there. Um, so various ways to measure gene expression and more on them here. Um, but those are just an idea of some of the techniques that you might use if you want to look at various levels of expression. If you want to see what's interacting with what, um, you can basically, you often have to get them to freeze together. So you can use like cross-linking methods, um, such as with formaldehyde, to actually get the like the protein proteins to stick together or the protein nucleic acids to stick together. Um, and then you can figure out what was stuck together. Um, so this is the basic idea of like chip seek where, where you were talking about here or art rip seek where basically you cross link them together and then you actually sequence what they were stuck on. Um, you can use this technique called immunoprecipitation um, to use an antibody to that recognizes one thing you're interested in. Then you can isolate it based on that antibody and then um, unlink them and sequence them. This amino precipitation, um, you'll probably this IP um, is something that you might see a lot, as well as the idea of co-IP, um, so co-amino precipitation. We're using antibody to pull down one thing. Um, so to like, basically you can attach, typically these are attached, these antibodies are attached to beads and then you can like magnetic beads and you can use a magnet to isolate those beads and then get rid of all the other stuff and wash it off. And then your bees have the antibody and that's attached to the thing of interest. And so then you're able to see that. And if you do a co-IP, you're using milder conditions with your washes. And so you're able to then look and see what's bound to that thing that you pulled down. You can also do similar things, which is like a pull down. I don't know. I I, I've always thought that pull down was like an IP, but apparently a pull down is, is technically when you're using something other than an antibody. So maybe your bees are attached to some sort of substrate or some sort of ligand. So something that this protein of interest binds to and you pull it down that way. Okay, 
So that was looking what's happening in cells. What if we want to actually get cells to do something for us? What if we want them to get them to make a specific protein for us or to express a specific gene um, product, to get a gene product or something? If you do this, this is gonna be done, you can do this through molecular cloning, another super duper fundamental technique um, in biochemistry and molecular biology, where basically you take that messenger RNA instructions, that cDNA we talked about before, and you actually stick it into a plasmid. Um, so this is like a circular piece of DNA, which then you can stick into cells, often like bacterial cells to get them to make the protein. You can use various methods of like viral vectors and stuff. So the vectors like this vehicle, it's this piece. So we were talking about plasmid before. It's basically like your plasmid and it's going to allow you to get your the thing that you cloned in there into the cells. Um, and so there are like viral vectors and things like that that are often used for mammalian cells. Um, there's also, you can clone nowadays with like CRISPR, things can get cloned into the actual, or I don't know if you'd still call it cloning, but if, yeah, you get the, yeah, I guess you would. Um, you typically call it like gene editing, but basically you would then stick that thing that you're interested in, or you somehow modify the DNA that's actually in the cells. So it's like a permanent um, way. There's also like viral methods that like integrate into the genome. I'm not gonna get into that, but basically you need to be able to manipulate these nucleic acid sequences and stitch them together in various ways. When we do molecular cloning, um, the type that I do, um, I'm typically making plasmids and I'm sticking in bacteria to get the bacteria to make a protein for me. So I need to cut the DNA or somehow make PCR copies of the DNA um, that then I can stick into this plasmid and this plasmid is going to serve as a vector to get it into the cells. Um, I've also do this, a method of this with like bacteria, with um, baculoviral expression. Um, so to express in insect cells, and I have more on that um, on my protein purification um, page um, here. But um, back to this, to actually get the plasmid or whatever you cloned into cells, there are different methods. There's like transfection methods. To get genetic information into cells, it's called transfection. If we're doing it into bacteria, we call it transformation. Often when we're doing it into bacteria, we're using like this heat shock method where basically we have these chemically competent bacterial cells, these beacon bacterial cells, and then we stick them in, give them a, a shock, a heat shock. We stick them really quick into a water bath for like 40 seconds. This is gonna kind of open up pores in the bacteria and then that, um, that DNA or the nucleic acid can sneak in um, and voila, you let it recover and grow and you get, then you can have it make your protein. Um, so there's also other methods and other methods are going to be used for other types of cells as well. Um, you can't really make chemically competent cells and heat shock them when we're talking about human cells or things like that. So there are various viral delivery methods on um, electroporation using electricity, um, various cationic carriers. So cation like positively charged, they're going to kind of like neutralize this negatively charged nucleic acid, allow it to get um, into and near, near and into the cells. Um, so for the bacteria though, you're often, you need to select to make sure that you're only allowing to grow ones that have taken in the plasmid. So these, not all the cells are going to take in the plasmid. Um, and so you want, you only want to feed the ones that actually took in the plasmid. Um, and so you can do this using antibiotics and selection markers. So on that plasmid, in addition to having the instructions for making the protein of interest, they also have like an antibiotic selection, um, like um, an antibiotic resistance gene. This is going to give them resistance to a specific antibiotic. And then if you add the antibiotic to the media, then the only the ones that have the resistance to it, so those that have the plasmid, will be able to grow. And this is going to allow you to only let those ones grow, not let the ones grow that don't have your plasmid, which is really important because one, you don't want to feed the stuff you don't need. And two, those other things, they might, without the plasmid, they might be like have better fitness. So maybe the plasmid is harder on them, especially. And so like it makes slightly toxic or something. They want to grow as well, but because they have the antibiotic, they're the only ones that can grow. The antibiotic selection is going to allow you to know that the plasmid was there, but not that the that the insert was actually in the plasmid, not that the thing that you cloned was actually in there. So you don't know if your cloning works, you just know that the transformation worked and that the plasmid's in there. 
One way to see if you're to get an idea of if your cloning works is this method called blue-white screening, or basically when you do your cloning, you do it into this plasmid that has this, um, this gene that you disrupt. When you disrupt that, then it's going to prevent it from making this blue product. Um, and then you can visualize and see which of the colonies are blue and which are white. Um, and you want to use one of the white ones um, in this method. But that doesn't tell you if the sequence is right, just that this gene got interrupted. And so to know if the sequence is right, um, they're very, to really, really know, you need to do DNA sequencing. Um, to get a sense of it, um, you can do like um, a restriction enzyme digest. So if you know that there's a specific sequence in there that can get recognized and cut by a restriction enzyme, which is a protein that recognizes specific DNA sequences and cuts them, um, if that sequence is only present in the plas in the insert you put in there, you'll be able to see um, based on if it, how many cuts you get. Um, you can also use a similar type of thing where if you know a sequence, you can then use colony PCR. So PCR, like we talked about earlier, but just directly on the colony um, to see if a sequence was present. Um, in order to do the colony PCR, you, um, we actually just do that straight from the gunk. Um, but to send it for sequencing or something, you're going to have to, and, or to do this restriction digest, you have to purify the plasmid out of the cells, which you can do with this kit called a mini prep. Um, this is going to use those little columns I talked about earlier where they have the membrane that things bind to. Um, basically, this takes the cells, it breaks them open, it then sticks that DNA or RNA or sorry, it sticks that plasma DNA onto the membrane and gets rid of everything else. There's also versions called a mega prep and a gigi prep, giga prep um, and a midi prep, I think, um, basically different versions from, that will be for larger starting um, amounts of material. Um, but the mini prep is probably the one that you're going to do the most commonly. And again, so this mini prep is isolating that plasma DNA, and then you can look in the plasma DNA and see what's present, or you can stick that plasma DNA into other types of cells. So in addition to using this when you want to see what whether the sequence is right and everything, this is also really commonly used if you want to get that plasmid and put it into a different type of cell. We commonly use different cells when we're cloning and when we're doing like expression and things like that. Um, and so the mini prep is going to be allowing us to purify out that plasmid um, DNA. When you send things for sequencing, you're going to have to interpret the results. And so here's more on how to interpret it. Basically focus on the ends. Typically those are going to be the most, or not the ends, not the ends of the sequencing. The ends of the sequencing are probably going to be the noisiest, but the ends of the insert where you actually like made changes to the DNA, those are going to, like those junctions are going to be the most prone for errors. And so you really want to look carefully there. Um, a lot of times these days, so when I um, started um, doing sequencing type of stuff, it was always Sanger sequencing, which is like traditional sequencing. Um, now we use, um, typically use like whole plasmid sequencing, where they just cycle the whole plasmid as opposed to cycling just a region that you specify based on primers. Okay, then you can also make changes to the to that sequence. So remember, you can stick so you can stick a plasmid into bacteria, and the bacteria will make a protein. Well, what if you change the sequence on that plasmid? Well, now you're going to change the sequence of the resulting protein, and then you can see what change what effects those changes had. And so, a way that we can do this is the site directed mutagenesis, where basically we specify specific changes we want made um, in a common way, is like quick change or slick like slick um, based cloning. Um, and so, more on that here. Um, when you're working with like purified DNA or purified RNA, how much of the stuff do you know actually have? Um, so measuring protein concentration, there's a bunch of ways. Some of them are dye-based, some of them are fluorescent based. The most common dye-based one you're probably going to use is like a Bradford assay. Um, and then you can also use like UV280 um, to get an idea of the protein concentration based on how much UV light it absorbs. Um, nucleic acids also absorb UV light um, and they absorb, you get the most specific information, like 260 nanometers for the DNA and RNA. Um, and you can measure, use this thing called Beer's Law to convert the absorbance to the concentration if it's a pure solution. Um, and so more on that on these posts. Um, some more methods, just these are just some more like random main methods. I talked before about native page, how we can keep things together. Well, what if you actually want to see what the protein is bound, whether the protein is bound to a specific um, 
or whether a protein binds to a specific sequence um, or a specific nucleic acid um, fragment. Um, so basically what you do is you can make a probe like we talked about before with those radio labels, RNA or DNA, so it's bigly. Uh, and then you can then mix that with the pure protein and run a native page to see, okay, if it's bound, then it's going to cause a shift um, when it causes a shift, then I'm going to have the DNA or the RNA is going to travel slower than it was before. Um, and then you're able to see where it is um, located in the gel. Um, so depending on the size of the thing, it'll be like a page gel or an agarose gel. Um, but then you're visualizing the radioactivity. Um, there's also, we talked so we talked about these like the chip, um, various amino precipitation, things like that. Here's some more methods to study protein-protein and protein-nucleic acid interactions. A method that I used a lot in my grad school was this slot blot assay where basically you mix protein and labels RNA or DNA, um, and then you separate them instead of with the gel, you separate them based on like you vacuum them through this stack of membranes, um, and then the protein will bind on the top and the nucleic acid will bind on the bottom the free nucleic acid, and then you see where the nucleic acid is, whether it was bound to the protein and therefore it's on the top membrane or it went straight through and therefore it's on the bottom membrane. Um, so that's the way that you can do that. Um, you can also, so basically restriction fragment length digest is kind of like what we talked about with the analytical restriction digest before for your cloning. There's also other ways, reasons that you might want to do it. Um, phage display. So this is going to allow you to find um, proteins that bind to a specific like target of interest that you have immobilized on some sort of like plate or something. You get these um, phages, which are bacteria infecting viruses, to actually express this um, the protein that you want, but to stick it onto like the outside of this phage. Um, and this phage is these little like things sticking out, and then you have it stick on this end of the thing that was stuck out. And then you stick it, you take it, and you do this because the phages are really helpful because you're able to use these like libraries where you can stick in tons and tons of different sequences. Each of these phages will then express a different protein. And then you wash all of these phages over that dish with the thing that you had bound to the dish. Um, and now the phages that bind to the thing that was bound to the dish will get stuck. The other things will wash out and you can continue this in cycles to find the best binders. And then because you have this, you can get the sequence because you have the sequence connected through this phage. So it's a really helpful technique for discovering things often used for like antibody, discovering antibodies. Um, like the common antibodies that'll bind things. Um, so more on that here. Also um, in undergrad, I studied uh, kinase. So I have information about measuring kinase activity. So like phosphorylation. Um, when we're measuring, so before when I was talking about radioactivity, it was like in a gel. So you use this like auto radiography, you basically stick a screen on it. Every place there's radioactivity, it's going to, you'll see a signal on the screen when you scan the screen. There are also methods where you can measure radioactivity um, based, like that's stuck on a filter or that's in a liquid or something. Um, there's this method called liquid scintillation counting, where basically you put things in little vials and then you stick them in this machine and it'll give you a readout of the count. Um, so more on that here. Um, cell culture, so mammalian cell culture. Um, it's more complicated than bacterial cell culture. Um, a common cell type that we use is like HEK293. Um, there's also like HeLa cells, there's various other cell lines. More on these cells um, in this post. Um, when you're working with them, you're often working in dishes and then you have to cut them off of the dishes in order to give them more space because they'll keep growing and growing and growing. And while well, they're attached to the bottom of the dish, they're gonna like outgrow themselves. They don't have enough room. They don't have enough resources. So you have to do this like splitting or passaging where basically you have to take them off the plate and dilute them and stick them on more plates or a bigger plate or something like that. Um, and so this attachment is commonly done with like TRIPS and EDTA. You can learn more about it here. Um, you often, often want to like freeze down stocks of those cells without actually killing them. You want to put them in hibernation um, and you can do this with cryopreservation. Um, more on that here. Um, okay, now just some like things about any type of experiments, just designing your experiment. You wanna make sure you have controls. You have like a positive control that you know that it can work. Um, so that if you have an actual positive sample, it will give you the result that you expect. You also want a negative control, which tells you that there's no, like it gives you your background and it tells you that this, this, if there isn't the thing that I'm looking for, then I'm not going to see a signal. Um, so more on these types of things in this experimental design. Um, 
planning your experiments. I like to plan ahead, um, take good notes, all of these various things. Here are some tips for that. Um, for any of these experiments, you're probably going to have to make a lot of buffers or solutions or various things like that. More on that in these posts. This is another one of those fundamental things, um, making buffers and stock solutions where basically you have a more concentrated version of something and then you can dilute that into various solutions. So a tip is like, instead of making everything from weighing out solids, it's helpful to make these stock solutions and then you can just be mixing liquids and diluting them. Um, you're often doing like a serial dilution where basically you go like a half, a half, a half, or a quarter, 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 or that sort of thing. Um, it allows you to do a large range of concentration sizes. Um, and it also is, allows you to dilute more accurately. Um, various glassware and equipment. Um, finally, some things about structural biology. So if you actually wanna see and look what proteins look like at the atomic level, how are they put together? Um, then there's methods like cryo-EM, cryo-electron microscopy, and x-ray crystallography, um, hydrogen deuterium exchange mass spectrometry. So basically this is going to tell you about like um, the, structure, the secondary structure and the flexibility and things about a protein, maybe where things bind, various things like that, but at the peptide level, so you're not actually seeing things. With cryo-EM, it's kind of like taking a picture, but with like a bunch of different, um, a, a bunch of different copies of things and then averaging them together because they're so small, you need a lot of pictures of them in order to actually like put it together and see them. With crystallography, you, you have a lot of copies, but you get them to freeze in place uh, or you get them to all freeze in the exact same pose. Whereas with cryo-EM, you get them to just like freeze wherever they are. Um, then you find, you kind of like orient them with computationally to put them together and average them. With X-ray crystallography, you get all the copies to freeze in the exact same position, um, and then you shine X-ray beams at them, and then the beams bang, like get diffracted. Basically, they bounce off, and they like interact with one another, give you this pattern of spots that then you work back from in order to get to, um, the protein structure. Um, it's harder than it sounds, um, and here's more tips about very, or methods that we use in protein crystallography. Um, if you want to learn about protein expression, as promised, I have a whole page on that. Um, so recombinant protein expression, um, what we talked about before, getting the bacteria or the other cells to make the protein, basically your workflow, um, what, have, what to do if things don't go according to plan. The, typically, when we're doing a protein purification, it's involving some sort of protein chromatography, which is using those columns um, filled with this resin. Um, we filled this resin, these little beads, different types of resin, um, so charged resin or resin bound to various things, um, resin with different sizes. So there's various ways in that we can purify a protein. We're often using, because when we're doing recombinant protein expression, we can basically control the sequence we put in. We can stick a tag on it, like an affinity tag. So this is often like a his tag or a strep tag. Um, this is a little extra sequence on the end of our protein that will then bind to the specific resin and allow us to purify it out based on that. And then we can also purify it based on properties that it has without that tag, or even with the tag, but just based on the protein itself, such as its charge with ion exchange chromatography, its size, its size exclusion chromatography, et cetera. And we're often using a machine um, called an FPLC, a fast performance liquid chromatography or fast protein liquid chromatography, um, um, commonly like an ACTA. Um, here's more on doing the actual cloning, doing expression in baculovirus, um, so in insect cells, which can be good if you have a more complicated protein that the bacteria don't have the machinery to fold or modify correctly. Um, there's also like cell three expression methods. Um, you can do cool things like introducing in, in non-canonical or um, amino acids. Um, you can also optimize the codon so it may be expressed better. Um, when you're actually purifying things, there's various ways like break open the cells and help um, shear DNA with ultrasonication, um, dialysis to help with like buffer exchange and desalting, other methods for desalting, methods for concentrating, um, measuring various things like that and that we talked about before, and then finally flash freezing your protein. So that is an overview of a whirlwind overview of various lab techniques, and I also have a page with, po with, technique, with tips for like more practical tips. So hope that helped. So there is a lot of stuff on the page, but don't worry about most of it. Um, I'm going to kind of try to emphasize the things that you'll use the most commonly probably, which are going to be like the page gels, the agarose gels, so to separate protein and DNA by size, 
um, various ways to stain them and look and see what's there. PCR, a way to make lots of copies of DNA. Um, ways to measure their interactions, things about molecular cloning, um, sticking DNA sequences into say a plasma, getting, putting that plasma into bacteria, maybe getting the bacteria to make the protein. Speaking of that, I have a whole page on protein purification and protein expression and various things like that that I'll take you quickly through um, later. Um, but molecular cloning um, is a really common thing that you'll do. Um, as well as then gels to analyze the things that you did, um, various various things like that. Um, so basically cloning, gels, PCR, um, those are some of like the key, key things. And then there are other methods that go along with them. Um, and then a little bit about cell culture, about experiments in general, making solutions, um, structural biology, things like that. But really, really, really um, the fundamental things are going to be electrophoresis, um, gel electrophoresis, separate things by size, various methods to stain or visualize what's there, maybe do a blot, um, like a Western blot to actually see if a specific protein is there. Um, and then use like a mini prep maybe to, so molecular cloning, you can stick the sequence 